Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm sure people are going to continue to to trickle in here, but we've got a, a really good showing and excited about this presentation. This is the Fuels Institute's presentation on a recent report that that we commissioned with uh, Guidehouse Insights, and we have Sam and Mike here today, and that are going to walk us through that report. Uh, this is a this this report is a look at uh, decarbonizing medium and heavy duty vehicles and kind of uh, where the Fuels Institute is is jumping off from, and and getting involved in. in Mr. Eichberger can share more with with the content there and the purpose and mission. Um, but just to let everybody know uh, we are going to go through uh, our slides in the presentation. There'll be a, a Q and A at the end. So if you want to post your questions uh, in in the in the application. We'll try to keep an eye on those and we'll if we got a whole bunch of them, we might have to respond to them after the fact, but we'll get to as many as possible. So um, without further ado, I'd, I'll pass I'll pass it over to John. And again, please keep those questions coming in. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon. If you're not in California, if you're in California on a Friday morning, we appreciate it. Um, we published this paper beginning of uh, this month. So Timing has been out there about three to four weeks. And as Jeff said, we're going to walk through kind of the highlights of the study. I'm going to let Sam and Mike do most of the details on the findings, but I'm going to just kind of frame it up for you. <clears throat> so we decided to commission this paper for a very specific reason. Um, we want to take a look at what was happening, the complexity, diversity, the medium heavy duty space. We started hearing a lot of commentary about um, we can take the strategies that are being successful in the light duty market and just apply it and just, quote, quote, just apply it to the medium and heavy duty market. And we knew intuitively that that was not necessarily going to work, uh, but we wanted to really better understand the medium and heavy duty space. We asked Guidehouse, we've worked with several times, they do fantastic work, to take a look at the market, break it down for us, and really help us itemize what are the vehicles within the space, uh, what are their duty cycles, what are their energy needs, what are the use cases and then evaluate them for how easily might we be able to deploy some decarbonization strategies? What are some of the strategies that might be viable for different sectors and different use cases? Um, so that was the, the motivation behind it. And we think about why we wanted to focus on medium heavy duty. So much of the research we've already done at the Fuels Institute and so much of the research that's being published on a regular basis is almost exclusively focused on the light duty space. And if you look at the bottom right corner there, that makes sense. Um, in 2019, EPA attributes 762 uh, million metric tons of CO2 emissions to the passenger car market. And you add the light duty vehicles to it, you're looking at more than, you know, a thousand uh, million metric tons. I, I'm not going to do the math there because I will get it completely wrong, but it's a lot, right? It's a gazillion. Um, and then you take a look at medium heavy duty, it's a fraction. That being said, it is still a significant portion. And you take a look at the breakdown they represent 30% of on-road greenhouse gas emissions. And so it is a significant chunk of our uh, emissions profile, even though there's only 12 million light duty vehicles compared to 260, 270 million light duty vehicles, just 12 million medium and heavy duty vehicles. They only represent 5% of all vehicles on the road, but 30% of the emissions. And so <clears throat> we knew that there was a disproportionate effect on GHG emissions from this sector. And it needs a special attention. If we want to be serious about reducing emissions, we need to look at this market, not as one continuous homogenous market, but respect the diversity and complexity that characterizes these vehicles and their use cases, and really break it down, start thinking about solutions that can be applied to each individual subsector in the most efficient and effective way. And so that was the motivation behind our decision to work with Guidehouse on moving forward with this study. And I think as Sam and Mike walk through the findings of the report, we get into the discussion afterwards, you'll see that's an extremely valuable assessment because from here, it serves as a launching pad. And we just launched a medium heavy duty committee at the Fuels Institute to build upon this study and really figure out how we can provide more insights to the market. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sam and Mike, and they're going to want to walk through their methodology and the results. So, uh, gentlemen, I'll hand it over to you. Sam, you're on mic. You're on mute. 
<laughs> Thanks, John. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, this is a very complex market. You know, even though it represents you know less than a quarter of all the vehicles on the road, there's a wide variety of different kinds of vehicles. And even amongst those those vehicles, there's uh, a lot of customization uh, and a lot of variation of those types. So we, the study took a look at uh, 17 different applications of medium and heavy duty uh, vehicles, which comprise about 91% of all of those vehicles on the road, about 94% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And amongst that, you know, we broke it down under five main categories of vehicles, vans, pickups, Rigid trucks, you know, which would be like box trucks, medium medium duty box trucks, um, and and also things like uh, uh, refuse trucks and so on, uh, tractor trailers, and then other uh, other vehicles like low cab forward trucks, step vans, and buses. Uh, and then the applications we looked at uh, things like uh, vi um, last mile cargo delivery, long haul cargo, regional cargo. Um, construction, uh, heavy heavy duty construction vehicles, um, government uh, vehicles, utilities, school buses, and then other, which was about 18% of, of the vehicles uh, in the study. So um, you can see that, you know, there's quite a, quite a diverse mix here, and it's spread, you know, across all of these different vehicle types and different applications. Uh, you know, so for example, within, within the, the pickup truck segment, uh, you know, you can have uh, things like, you know, standard pickup trucks, you know, used as snow plows, um, but you also have pickups uh, where the bed has been removed and they've got um, other hardware that's been put on the back uh, that are often used by utilities or uh, things like cable companies and so on for various types of service. Uh, you've got uh, vans that are used for everything from construction to plumbing and electricians uh, to haul tools. And then, you know, the bigger uh, rigid trucks and tractor trailers as well. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And looking at this at this market, and you know, we broke it down, you know, by those same categories, and looked at what is uh, the market share, you know, in terms of the number of vehicles uh, for each of these uh, applications, and then what are the emissions from those? And you can see from this two categories in particular stand out as having a real disproportionate share of greenhouse gas emissions relative to their market share. And the biggest one here is long haul, long haul cargo, uh, long haul trucking. 40% uh, of the emissions coming from uh, those, uh, those vehicles, but they only represent 14% of the vehicle volume. And that's, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, it, it makes sense. You know, these are very large, very heavy vehicles. They, and they travel a lot of miles, you know, often, you know, 100 to 150,000 miles a year or more uh, for these vehicles, and they're driving all around the country. So it it makes sense that they, you know, for the number of vehicles, they would have, because of the mileage that they accumulate and the size of the vehicles, that they would have a disproportionate amount of the greenhouse gas emissions. And then regional cargo are uh, trucks uh, running about 40 to 60,000 miles a year. Uh, doing regional deliveries from distribution centers to stores, warehouses, that sort of thing. Um, areas like last mile cargo, light construction, um, heavy uh, heavy construction, uh, school buses, uh, transit buses, and uh, oil gas, oil and gas moving, logging emergency vehicles, all have uh, a lower share of emissions versus their market share of vehicles. Next slide. So in, in looking at this, um, we took a look at, uh, you know, different types of uh, alternative fuels uh, and what are some of the strengths and challenges of implementing those fuels as solutions to decarbonization. Uh, this is uh, clearly not an exhaustive list, but it's at a fairly high level. So uh, the first category is liquids and gases. Uh, so this is, includes uh, biofuels, biomethane, uh, you know, uh, propane, various other gaseous fuels, uh, electricity, uh, battery electricity, uh, primarily, uh, and then hydrogen. And from those, uh, for the liquids and gases, you know, the, the strengths of liquids and gases, it's, uh, it's an efficient use of renewable waste resources. Um, and infrastructure is relatively straightforward. 
uh, it, in some cases, it can be drop in, a drop-in replacement for fossil fuels, but even where it's not a drop-in replacement, it's largely the same type of infrastructure uh, in terms of fuel pumping, fuel storage. Uh, but the, the challenges here are uh, the limited capacity uh, for the most attractive resources, the, the most attractive uh, bio, uh, bio waste uh, resources uh, primarily for producing these. So there's it's hard to get enough of the fuel from the available uh, feedstocks uh, to, to make it a really viable alternative. Electricity um, is great for using uh, renewable electricity resources, so wind, solar, hydro. Um, there's a strong uh, momentum in terms of uh, R&D and development um, of battery technology, motors, power electronics, uh, a lot of it being driven by the light duty vehicle market, uh, where there's obviously a lot more uh, volume of vehicles and a lot of companies really pushing to go, uh, if not all electric, very close to all electric over the next 15 years. Um, and there's also a significant uh, payback potential in terms of TCO um, because of the significantly reduced operating costs, electricity generally being far cheaper than most uh, liquid fuel alternatives, uh, and also uh, reduced uh, service and maintenance costs for the vehicles in terms of reduced oil changes and engine maintenance and so on. Um, <clears throat> you also get zero uh, local emissions and reduced noise. The challenge, of course, with batteries, uh, just as it is with light duty vehicles, is the energy density of the energy storage system, which is the, the battery. Um, liquid fuels, um, depending on the, the fuel you're talking about, anywhere from 60 to 100 times the volumetric energy density uh, of uh, electricity. And um, the infrastructure capacity can also be a challenge depending on the, the, the type of application uh, and the type of fast charging you need uh, in order to get the uptime you need from these vehicles. Uh, and then there's also uh, it can be a significant capex in terms of the vehicles being more expensive up front uh, and the investments that have to be made in facilities upgrades or, or infrastructure uh, installations to support uh, a fleet of vehicles, a fleet of electric vehicles. And then hydrogen, um, you know, kind of in some ways falls in between here. Uh, much better energy density and weight advantages over battery power, uh, which makes it very suitable for, for long haul applications. Um, reduced noise compared to uh, internal combustion, uh, zero local emissions. But there's also the challenge of renewable hydrogen generation and distribution, uh, which today is extremely limited, uh, and uh, high capex and opex. Um, you have the same kind of challenges as with battery electric in terms of the upfront cost of the vehicles and then the opex uh, because right now with the limited hydrogen production uh, there uh, the hydrogen still tends to be uh, fairly expensive next slide please so from looking at all the the different use cases um, and uh, you know some of the we put together uh, this list of five attributes we kind of picked the, the two extremes in terms of what what are the best use uh, best applications for decarbonization and and the most challenging application. So on the on the the positive side, uh, we picked school busing. Um, in terms of stakeholder sensitivity, uh, this is uh, going electric here uh, is a great use case uh, with buses because where where buses are operating. Um, you know the the vehicles are usually owned by some uh, owned and operated by some government agency or for some government agency uh, so there's a, a sensitivity to uh, governmental policies but the uh, the the fleets also tend to serve vulnerable populations uh, in in the areas where where there's busing um, and they're also uh, operating in areas uh, oftentimes in residential areas uh, urban suburban areas uh, where uh, things like noise and pollution are real concerns. Um, the ownership period uh, is also an advantage because they, uh, wh whoever is operating the bus fleet uh, tends to keep, that, keep those buses in operation until the vehicle is retired from basically from cradle to grave. Uh, and so uh, there, you know, there's, there's not, uh, not necessarily a transition of ownership during the life of that vehicle. Um, fueling opportunities because the school buses tend to return to a depot uh, and have significant downtimes. You know, there's usually usually a couple of hot spots in the morning and afternoon when they're picking up and dropping off students, and then the rest of the day 
the, the vehicles generally mostly sit idle, uh, which uh, means that it's easy to, to charge them even without having to uh, leverage uh, a lot of DC fast charging, which adds significantly to the cost. Um, and uh, there's also potential opportunities here um, because they're they're idle uh, the significant por portion, portions of the day, um, where as vehicle to grid integration um, starts to evolve over time, they, they could be leveraged uh, for some uh, interesting use cases there, some potential revenue opportunities, but that's still down the road. Um, operating regions, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stops, uh, a lot of stop start, which again makes them uh, amenable to um, electrification because you can take advantage of regenerative braking um, and uh, and then you know the local air quality concerns you know where buses are typically operating you know populated areas where where people live you don't want a lot of diesel emissions a lot of diesel soot uh, and smoke uh, so electric is great for that uh, and then the energy requirements again school buses typically don't um, rack up huge amounts of miles every day uh, so the limited route distance and the predictability um, uh, makes them very amenable uh, for electrification and as a, as a means for decarbonization. The flip side is long haul cargo. That's where decarbonization becomes a lot more challenging. Um, and so on stakeholder sensitivity, it's kind of tends to be kind of neutral. Um, there's uh, a lot of focus on long haul, but uh, the uh, a lot of times uh, the trucks will change ownership uh, multiple times during the vehicle's life cycle. And so understanding the, the condition of things like the battery, which tends to be one of the most expensive components on here, uh, can be a challenge. Um, the uh, ownership period uh, is, can be an impediment uh, because the, the vehicle trade-in cycle tends to be the shortest among all these applications. Uh, they may get uh, traded or sold every few years. Uh, or even less in some cases. Um, fueling opportunities is a problem for decarbonization here, um, what, regardless of whether uh, you're going with uh, liquid or gaseous fuels, electricity, or hydrogen. Uh, all of them have uh, posed significant challenges for long haul trucking. Um, hydrogen looks to be one of the most promising there uh, if they can develop uh, networks of hydrogen stations uh, along major trucking routes. But again, that doesn't exist today. And that's something that needs to be built out if, if that's going to be the direction they go. Um, operating regions, they operate virtually everywhere, um, oftentimes uh, lo running long distances in rural areas. So the uh, local air quality, the um, uh, issues around um, uh, emissions of things like carbon monoxide, uh, particulates, and so on, are less of a concern. Uh, because there's, there tends to be few people living around where these trucks are running uh, their long routes. Um, and then um, the, uh, uh, the decarbonization uh, is also a challenge there. And then energy requirements, um, because uh, long haul trucks often provide, uh, you know, the drivers are often essentially living uh, in there. You've got the hoteling functions and sleeper cabs. Um, you've also got uh, issues like refrigerated trucks uh, that put a significant additional energy demands on there. Um, so there's a, a lot of load uh, on these vehicles, uh, which means that you have to have an extremely large battery, uh, which is very expensive, very heavy. Uh, and because of, especially the mass, uh, you know, trucks typically being limited to 40 tons uh, and the revenue opportunities for, for long haul trucking is often tied to the amount of freight, the, the, the payload that they can carry. If you're carrying a 10 or 15,000 pound battery to get a 500 mile range out of this thing, that's eating into the potential payload capability of the vehicle and reducing the revenue opportunities. So that's a real challenge for, uh, for long haul. And uh, next slide. So of the, the top opportunities that we see, 50% um, of the market uh, accounts for about 42% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So 50% in terms of the, the vehicle sales, new, annual new vehicle sales, uh, they account for about 40, a little over 40% of the emissions. Um, and uh, the, the uh, biggest uh, areas here uh, are last mile cargo, um, and regional cargo, busing, and refuse trucking. Um, last mile cargo, uh, like busing, um, has a lot of the same advantages as busing, often operating in, in populated areas. 
um, and they uh, they also account for a significant portion of the uh, the emissions. Uh, next slide. The biggest challenges uh, as I talked about, you know, long haul trucking, um, you know, uh, accounts for 14% of the vehicle sales, but 40% of the overall emissions. This is the one that is going to be the the toughest nut to crack, um, and uh, you know, then then going down the list, uh, heavy construction vehicles, cement mixers, that sort of thing, uh, oil and gas, uh, but they are a relatively small portion of it. Uh, and then 80% of the v sales and 55% of the emissions coming from those other segments um, where where there is some uh, some opportunities for decarbonization. And I will hand uh, one more slide, I think. Uh, no, okay, that's it. I'll hand it back to you, John. Uh, thanks, Sam. So um, within the paper, as Sam was talking about the different categories in the 17, uh, different uh, vehicle applications. The top five and the bottom five are broken down. Each one of those five categories that lend themselves to advantage, neutral, or impediment to decarbonization. So, when we pulled in the paper, we started looking at said, okay, what from our perspective at the Fuels Institute, great work Guidehouse Insights did. <clears throat> what are the key takeaways? And I've broken it down to kind of takeaways for three different audiences. The first one, policymaker and advocates. And the number one thing is we cannot ignore the medium heavy duty market when it comes to abating greenhouse gas emissions. It's 30% of transportation emissions. We can't ignore it or take it for granted. We have to focus on it, but we can't take light duty vehicle strategies that were successful for light duties and assume they're gonna work for medium heavy duty. As Sam broke it down, there are very unique uh, use cases and, and situations that require specific attention. And so we can look at the greatest opportunities and challenges and focus our attention and resource on most beneficial strategies. It's a huge investment and effort going to reducing emissions from school busing. And as Sam mentioned, a lot of advantages there. We have to recognize that they only represent two or three percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Bigger chunks, which larger uh, footprint on greenhouse gas emissions might be more challenging, but we need to prioritize how we focus our attention and really look at those for where is the best investment to have the greatest impact in the short term and deliver a return on investment to the, to the industries that are running this truck. So this breakdown, looking at the difficulties, the market share and the GHG emissions from each uh, vehicle category, it's a real great tool to prioritize our investment and our focus of uh, policy. For vehicle owners, you know, the pressure to reduce emissions is growing. <clears throat> um, the whole of uh, evolution of ESG environment, social and governance policies and practices is taking on a whole new level of importance. Whether you are publicly traded or private, financial firms, investors, banks that are looking at loan underwriting, they're all starting to ask for your ESG uh, plans and figure out how what your risk tolerance is and your risk abatement strategies are. The SEC's proposals on ESG are going to make publicly traded companies who are subject to the rules account for the emissions of their suppliers and their customers. So that scope three is going to put more pressure on uh, trucking companies to really understand and do what they can to reduce the emissions of their fleet. Um, but we have to look at how that breaks down. So using this report gives you some guidance as to, you know, what are our opportunities? What are some options? What might we assume to be the difficulty or the ease of trying to address our, our fleet's emissions and start taking that much more strategic approach to that? And finally, you know, as Sam was mentioning, a lot of these categories do not lend themselves to electrification very easily. How do we reduce emissions from the, the vehicles on the road now? How do we reduce emissions from combustion engines? Those on the, that are in the market today, those are coming on the market in the, in the future. And really look at low carbon energy. And if you're a low carbon energy provider, thinking about the pressures of ESG, regulatory environment, financial institutions putting pressure on the fleet operators to reduce their emissions, looking at the breakdown of the vehicles and how they contribute to GHG emissions and what the opportunities might be. I think this opens up the door for low energy, uh, low carbon energy providers to really make a push and bring their market, their products to the market much more effectively and efficiently by capitalizing on these criteria, these categories, and the emerging pressures of ESG, I think, makes a lot of a great opportunity to create partnerships between the energy providers and the fleet operators to have a meaningful impact on emissions while providing a, an economical and efficient approach, <clears throat> approach for the fleet owner to reduce their emissions. And then my final slide here is, you know, I can't stress enough. There is no single solution. No, Sam had a slide that said no single solution. It is 
absolutely impossible to take one strategy and apply it to every single category of vehicle and use case within the need in the heavy duty market. We need to really focus the strategies specifically on what we're targeting here. And when we're thinking about policies, we need to align our targets to viability. If you're going to say we need to go zero emission on long haul vehicles in 10 years, that's not likely viable. We need to be realistic about this and pragmatic and think about, okay, where can we have the greatest impact in the shortest amount of time while working on the more challenging categories, recognizing they're going to take probably greater investment and probably longer to have a real impact on emissions over the time. But we need to recognize that and build our policies and our targets and our objectives around that realization, that recognition of the realities of the market. We have to really focus on how we reduce carbon intensity of all transportation and fuel pathways. We have 12 million of these vehicles on the road. They're not going away tomorrow. Even if you can wave a magic wand and have a technology for new vehicles, replace what's out there, it's going to take a long time to wean the existing market off. And it's going to take even longer because we're not going to be able to just immediately bring all new vehicles to a new technology tomorrow. So we need to think about how we can expedite the marketability of lower carbon fuels into the market to have a benefit on the existing fleet, as well as the benefit on the fleet that's coming in that has not transitioned to a new technology. <clears throat> Combustion engines are going to be around a very long time, especially in this, in this sector. How do we expedite the availability of low carbon fuel options? And finally, something that we've been talking about for the last several years is we cannot look at vehicles and energy in isolation. We have to look at how the vehicles and the energy they use work together and what the life cycle impact of that the holistic system is on the environment, is on total cost of ownership, is on operations. If we were really serious about transforming the transportation space, we have to look at them in, in uh, conjunction with one another. And that includes looking at regulations. We have regulations that focus on vehicle fuel e vehicle efficiency and emissions in the, the engine side. But then we have regulations on the fuel side and they don't necessarily work together. So figuring out a way to create an approach from a market base and a regulatory base that takes into consideration both the energy and the vehicle is going to be critical if we're really going to have a meaningful impact on emissions in the near and long term. Um, with that, we'll open up the questions and answer real quick. Uh, selfish uh, self-promotion here. Our annual meeting is in about four weeks in Indianapolis. We're going to have a session on fleet efficiency and decarbonization. So we're going to dive into this study again, but even more in depth if you have stakeholders that have great conversation about that. We're going to be looking at all sorts of strategies, electrification, hydrogen, natural gas, biofuels, and the economics around it. Because when we started the Fuels Institute about nine and a half years ago, one of the principles that we brought into it was you have to balance the impact on consumers and end users from the economic perspective with the impact on emissions. Because if you bring a solution to market that's unaffordable or puts undue burden on consumers, that solution will fail. And so we're really looking at how we balance our approach to emissions in a way that is sustainable from a business consumer economic perspective, as well as from an environmental perspective. And with that, um, I'll leave this up for a little while. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Hobie to be the uh, moderator of any questions that may have come in. So, Jeff, the con is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sam and Mike. Uh, great presentation. We got a couple questions coming in. Um, I will. I will also add that this is this is a, a perfect. I, I love this report. It's a great kickoff for our, uh, the Fuels Institute's new initiative and committee as we dive deeper into all of those things that John just mentioned. So if you're not currently involved in the Fuels Institute, and this is something that is on your company's or or your organization's agenda, please feel free to follow up with us after this and and see what it see if you can get involved with some of these discussions so as john said at the end of this at the end of may we're going to be having our fuels 2022 event lots of great panelists that are going to be talking on this uh topic um so we've got a couple questions here uh the first one's from victoria and i'm going to try to it's, it's a question related to how much is is esg driving um, this discussion and, and is there anything in in ESG plans that's specific for the transportation sector? Um, I can take a stab at that if you'd like. Um, right now, ESG planning is is really hitting home in the supply chain. 
So anybody that's in the supply chain, so we'll, let's use third party carriers because they meet the definition of these fleet owners that have medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, they could be a private company and but they're hauling for a publicly traded company. That publicly traded company is going to be asking that their third party carriers for an ESG plan or their emissions profile and other things in the ESG. So, so that's the relationship right now. There really is no mandate, even in the proposed rules um, um, that are directly directed at the transportation sector. But I look at it as anybody in the, in the supply chain of goods or fuels is going to be impacted by, uh, by this. And of course, it, it really hits home with this topic uh, that we're touching on right now. All, we're talking to a lot of fleet owners and operators that are struggling with this. They're looking for the solutions that best fit their organization, and um, they will most certainly be on our Fuels Institute committee as we walk through this. The other Jeff, part of that I can, question, I can just add to that real yeah. quick. My perspective as well is you've got after COP26, the major financial investment firms in the world that control $130 trillion of investment assets made a commitment to make ESG a top priority for their investment decisions. So that's one lever. The other one is I'm hearing from a lot of companies that their banks starting to ask for their ESG plan before they consider them for loans. So access to capital is being affected. And then the whole SEC rule is going to make your customers much more susceptible to what your operations are of your fleet owner. So it's a pinch remove. Regulations, yeah, but man, the number of entities that are focused on ESG these days is impressive. And if you don't pay attention to it, it really is going to be up to your detriment. Yeah. And yeah. Just, just to fo follow up on that, um, you know, a lot, a, a lot of major corporations have uh, or are adopting science-based targets initiative uh, for carbon neutrality. Um, and in some cases, like General Motors, for example, has said they want to be carbon neutral by 2040. And to do that under the, the science-based targets initiative, you know, that means, you know, going all the way down the, the value chain. It's not just a matter of, you know, planting some trees for carbon offsets. You know, they've got to actually uh, have a plan to reduce carbon, in, not only in their own operations, but as you said, Jeff, you know, across the, the entire supply chain, um, getting getting the carbon emissions out of that that whole chain in order to meet those targets. Yeah. Finally, it, it, go sorry, ahead. I would just add as well that the, there is a sense that the president's executive order asking the, the federal government to do all they can to move into electrified uh, vehicles and um, infrastructure as fast as they can and to come up with a plan to do so. It'll be interesting to see how that kind of flows through the value chain. There's a lot of folks that are connected to the, the government supply chain, both for just the vehicles they're putting on the road and then it, it'll be interesting to see what their interpretation of of doing all you can means uh, for all the folks that they interact with in addition to their own fleet. So it's another driver that isn't specifically legislation, but it's definitely out there and official and is being moved on. You know, I just saw a comment come up in the in the chat that if banks are being more rigorous about ESG plans or they like to be uh, support lease over ZEVs, Maybe my my hope is one of the things that fuels is trying to do is we need to look at the life cycle impact of the vehicles, not just a tailpipe element. So I think there's been this confusion that decarbonization equals electrification. Electrification is a great tool, but it's not the best tool for all scenarios, not the best tool for all markets. And so trying to get this holistic approach, as I mentioned, but also a life cycle approach to carbon, not just a what you see, smell, and hear, but where all the energy came from, where the vehicles came from, and what their end of life looks like, that has to be part of the equation. And just to follow up on that, John, um, you know, as an example, it's, doesn't, it's not so much within the context of the medium and heavy duty market that we're talking about here, but uh, Ford uh, last year when they established Ford Pro as their commercial vehicle division, um, you know, their, Ford is obviously making a big push into electrification. And as you said, that's not the only solution or even the best solution in many cases. But one of the things that Ford Pro, the Ford Pro division is doing as part of this is they have pulled in Ford Credit um, to uh, help with uh, commercial fleet customers that are that want to uh, buy Ford's electric uh, vehicles like the E-Transit and the F-150 Lightning to not only finance the vehicles, the purchase of the vehicles, but also to finance uh, any facility upgrades 
that need to go along with that. So if a fleet uh, has a depot that needs to have a bunch of chargers installed or uh, electrical capacity upgrade for that depot, um, Ford Pro through Ford Credit is also providing the financing for that in addition to the vehicle acquisition. And I expect that we will be seeing more uh, banks and, and other financial institutions getting involved in financing that uh, as we go forward. Excellent. Um, if I could uh, add, uh, I don't know that it's a final thought, but another thought on the life cycle. And in, in a previous life, I was uh, I ran a fleet at a large publicly uh, owned utility in the in the Midwest, and and we were I mean these medium duty vehicles are the the tools that get the job done. And there are two components that we're thinking of that the the ratepayers have essentially um, in, invested in this long lived asset, and so they they need to get their useful life out of it. You can't just write that stuff off the books and and take it essentially out of people's checkbooks. So it's a very direct mechanism to the folks that are funding these assets. And then as we sought to decarbonize inside our fleet, and we you know we're looking at biodiesel and that kind of thing. Um, we often found ourselves looking at how we're using the vehicle in a in a situation where those graphs that show the percent of the fleet and the miles, uh, you know, we, when you're alignment and you're doing 12 or 16 hours in, in a vehicle, that becomes your home. And there's a significant amount of load on the engine that is that uh, housekeeping. Uh, and there's a significant amount of idling. So in, in this application, we've got vehicles that have uh, you know, our engine hours <laughs> of 100,000 miles, and they've actually traveled 10,000 miles. Um, and so to harvest that that waste idle was a, a real opportunity without going uh, or finding it to an electrified platform to cut my fuel uh, expense by or, or use uh, by by 80 percent was a reasonable goal. And, and we didn't achieve it, but we tried every day um, just in how we use these these real tools uh, that real people are sitting inside each day to give value to the customer. I think the same can be applied to refrigeration units too on those big class yeah. A trucks, right? I mean, you, you, you got to keep the load cold um, and instead of idling the truck, you know, uh, plug it in. I mean, and so, you know, we know those technologies are out there and stuff. And so I think that's a lot of stuff we're gonna be talking about here in the future. And and also to your point, there's a, there's, there was a question regarding renewable diesel and, and what are our thoughts on that um, in managing emissions and, Renewable diesel is a is, has been a hot topic for the last couple of years. You know, we, you know, I think our thoughts there. My my personal thoughts are, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of pushing and pulling on this. We've got sustainable aviation fuel that's coming into the mix. We've got other demands being put on it. Um, it very well come could come down to, as as Sam said earlier, a feedstock restricted issue or a feedstock issue. So we need to look at what is the available feedstock. At the same time, what are the actual demands going to be if X percent of the fleet is electrified or moved on to a different fuel type? What's left? You know, what is that actual demand? You know, mid and long term. So these are all things that are really good questions that we have to ask. But um, you know, renewable diesel is is going to be and biodiesel are are going to be the drivers. But the only way you really can reduce your CO2 equivalent emissions on the existing fleet today. Um, of course, with with the other the other practices that Mike was talking about on idling and and and, and other some other efficiency um, gains that we can get from from after aftermarket technology. So uh, the other one that I'm interested in too is uh, uh, hybridiz uh, hybridization of of our medium and heavy duty vehicles. So we'll probably see some more on that as well. I want to make sure I get to everybody's questions here, guys. I, I apologize if I'm cutting off anybody. Um, um, are there other countries that are more advanced in decarbonization of this sector that we can learn from? What is working and what is not? That's a that's a very valid question because we see we see uh, the EU making strides where it's, it feels like sometimes the in this in the states we're a couple years behind what's going on there, but at the same time now they're running into energy demand issues. Um, Sam and Mike, you have any thoughts on that on a more global look at 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 this sector? Yeah, certainly. Uh, as you mentioned, Europe you know, has been uh, pushing more um, for, especially for uh, electrification in um, 
like last mile deliveries, uh, that sort of uh, vehicles. Um, and then in China, um, the, the Chinese government has had a lot of support for uh, for hydrogen uh, infrastructure development for trucking, for heavy duty trucking, long haul trucking. Uh, so that's like, you know, China is probably going to be the first market for that. But we're also, we're already, there's already uh, test fleets of uh, hydrogen tr fuel cell trucks running uh, in Europe. Uh, Hyundai has a fleet of, I believe, 20 um, fuel cell uh, trucks running in Switzerland uh, that they, they launched last year. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in hydrogen uh, for trucking as well in in Europe. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're obviously they face the same challenges that, that we do in this respect. You know, depending depends a lot on the the specific application. Um, you know, and there there is no one single solution. Uh, you know, I, I remember back in 2006. Uh, I wrote an article saying that, you know, the, the, the future of transportation does not include an energy monoculture uh, as it has for the past century. And, you know, it's not going to be just petroleum. There's going to be a, a variety of solutions and everybody's trying out all these different approaches. Sam and Mike, I have a question because one of the things, you know, Jeff mentioned the existing fleet and fuel options. But, you know, Mike, you were talking about efficiency and how you reduce your idling time and stuff like that. There's been testing on um, the drafting, the platooning, talk about autonomous vehicles. And Sam, I know uh, years ago you guys did quite a bit of research on what the impact of autonomous vehicle technology might be on fuel efficiency and fuel consumption. Have you guys anything recently looking at what advanced uh, driver assist systems in the heavy duty market might be able to do in terms of emissions reductions or energy consumption improvement? Yeah, previous uh, studies on uh, platooning, uh, for example, have shown the, the potential uh, for up to 10% reduction in fuel consumption for the following vehicles. The, the lead vehicle in a platoon would typically be about four to five percent reduction, uh, and then about up to ten percent for the following vehicles. Um, it it hasn't really taken off anywhere yet. Um, there are some significant challenges with doing platooning in terms of coordinating the, the trucks, you know, when and where they they join or or leave a platoon. Uh, but I think as we as we start to see deployments in the next few years of automated trucks uh, on some routes, that is likely to be one of the one of the first places where we really start to see platooning uh, take off um, because it, it'll be easier to deploy uh, in those vehicles uh, because you, you've got the sensors and the communications between the, the trucks. And um, it, it, it's gonna, I think that's that's going to likely be the first place where we really start to see some some real usage of platooning. One one thing I'm noting too is, and this is something that we all struggle with, right? Because technology is changing so quickly and so rapidly. It's it's just an amazing time that we're that we're that we're living in right now. But in the chat box, we're seeing that, you know, updates like real time updates on what other countries are doing. For example, hydrogen fuel cell um, adoption and what their what their goals are and what the, and what the actual orders that have been placed on vehicles and stuff. So, uh, it is you know it. At the Fuels Institute, we really try to expedite our research for this reason, right? Because things change so rapidly, and we've got a great board that that we bounce things off from. But you know, just in looking at the at the Q and A um, chat section, uh, it just reminds me of how quickly things change. But, but you know, um, Jeff, that also opens up a great new plug for Fuels 2022. Um, at this conference, I guarantee you, when the topics like this come up, there's someone in the audience who knows what's going on. And that's what so what what I like about what we what the fuel sense kind of brings together is we don't have an agenda, we don't have an objective. So we are open to everybody. We're inclusive of all options. So we start having conversations about what can we do. There's tons of hands pop up that we can do this, we can do this, we're trying this over here. That that collaborative sharing, I think at the time we're 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 at right now in the market, collaborating and sharing perspective and and, and experience it can be so important to finding solutions that make sense. If we wait for the government to tell us what to do, we're in big trouble. We have to work together as a diverse industry and really figure out what the path forward would make sense. Yeah, yeah, and and again, a number of the questions kind of kind of allude to that that need to collaborate. Um, Robert was asking, uh, medium heavy duty vehicles are predominantly by commercial industrial, 
how important is strategic planning to identify locations for charging, refueling, infrastructure, and getting stakeholders to buy in to justify those new investments, I suppose, as opposed to uh, trading in for hopefully a newer diesel vehicle. Um, at least you get some efficiencies there. But, you know, the, those types of community um, OEM to fleet type discussions, as well as uh, you know the the school bus example. You know how does a how does a, a state government, for example, use like the principles in ESG to apply for the IIJ a funding? You know for you know that's that's going to be up here, whether it's the 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 five billion on electric or the two point five billion you know on the on the competitive bid for other fuels. But you know it it really it really the community really does have to come together to ask to to answer those types of questions. Yeah, and that's um, yeah, it's a it's a good question, and it, it the the strategic planning is very important, um, you know, especially if you have a larger fleet, um, you know, and if especially uh, particularly on the electrification side, but even for you know for the other fuel options, you know, to understand you know how are you going to fuel these things, where where are you going to fuel them, uh, for EVs, you know, if you've got a significant fleet of vehicles that you're going to electrify, whether it's a fleet of school buses or uh, last mile delivery vehicles, delivery vans, um, that, you know, making sure you, know, you have to have the capacity, the electrical capacity at the site where you're going to uh, be doing the charging of those vehicles. And that's not always a trivial matter. Sometimes that requires a substantial investment in upgrading the electrical capacity at a depot, uh, you know, in order to, to charge 10, 50, 100 vehicles. Um, and it may or may not be possible. I mean, this is one of the things that the Guidehouse um, works with clients on is figuring out where where are the appropriate places to do this. Where where can you site these facilities to make sure you know to minimize or mitigate the the need for upgrades, uh, facility upgrades. And Mike, I'm, I'm sure from your uh, experience on your in your previous life, you probably had some had some challenges with that. But, and and that's I think when you when you step back and you say I've got five percent of the fleet producing you know twenty four percent of the emissions and the five percent is made up of all these small cuts of types of vehicles it it really builds the sense that these are tools and they're unique tools and and over fifty years we allowed ourselves in the specification of vehicles to say well you know what uh, fuel is cheap these engines are powerful. You know, the, my, my OEMs are great uh, partners, and I'm just going to continue to add weight and functionality onto a single chassis because that's that it, it's efficient if, if fuel is cheap and the chassis is being depreciated with low dollars. I want to keep doing that. But when we get into the value stream maps that talk about uh, hybridization or how are we going to build the next vehicle, and you start at the end of the value stream and say, what does this tool do? Because they're all tools. They're just they're tools with 240 horsepower engines on them, and that 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 power unit is being used to do 10% of the driving and 80% of the work, either with a power takeoff unit or a refrigeration, whatever that is. But if I if I have this work and when we benchmark Europe, that's where you see it. Maybe I maybe we're being incented to build smaller, more specialized units that have better power to rate ratios that match exactly the job that needs to be done instead of this kind of Swiss army knife that in the utility industry, we've definitely ended up with, you know, the line trucks that are you know, 40 feet long and weigh 40,000 pounds and they can do everything. <laughs> and uh, that, that was great. Uh, but it may not be great tomorrow, and it definitely doesn't have to be. You know, there's lots of examples where you you can build a better tool, you know, with the purpose in mind, and end up back at a a, a decarbonized powertrain that meets the need better. You know, going back to the conversation about infrastructure, you know, Sam, one of the criteria that you guys use to evaluate the ease or difficulty in decarbonization was access to the energy. So if you have a return of base fleet, then you can install your own fueling system and you're in control of your own energy needs and destiny. If you're over the road, you're relying upon, you know, the 150,000 fueling stations out there to install the energy that you need. We had a conversation earlier this week on our medium heavy duty committee. Uh, one of our board members who's really focused on the hydrogen sector said, you know, one concept we're exploring is creating collaborative fueling hubs. 
So if you want to bring a fleet of hydrogen vehicles on the road and they're going to be doing, you know, 500 mile runs, or something like that, every 200, 300 miles, you create a open access refueling hub that's kind of dedicated in the, you know, the, the trucking industry that's putting these vehicles on the road, works together to build that, to start creating this network. And then from there, you can, you can branch off in your hub and spoke type scenario. But this idea of how do we foster collaboration to bring these new solutions to market in the most cost effective way and try to take some of that chicken and egg onus off the market. Because quite frankly, I can't see a fleet buying a whole, a whole group of vehicles reliant on other people to service them until the other people have already stepped up to service them. It's a really dangerous thing. I mean, Mike, you would never send your long haul trucks out on the road unless you knew they could refuel. And I just hope somebody has decided to go and open up a station to help you out, right? So I think, you know, getting that type of discussion going about how, not should, but how, how do we do it? And getting people to work together, I think is a, is a great opportunity that probably has not been explored enough and probably should be. Yeah, I love the idea of keeping the fleets on the road. You know, for most fleets, if the if the truck is not on the road, it's not making money. You know, so to have that expanded network of charging um, or you know a hydrogen, et cetera, you know, available, it just it makes it makes the fleet that much more efficient. And that I think that actually gets back to Robert Perry's question too. You know, how do we get how do we get stakeholder buy-in to justify those investments? To John's point. You know, it's a lot easier to make that 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 investment if you can see it, if it's being rolled out in front of you. And yes, I can I can go 700 miles uh, instead of 500. So I think that's a that's a great point. Yeah, uh, if if a man, if a manufacturer can can get enough customers to commit to buying you know trucks of a, of a certain type, you know, then there's the opportunity to go. Uh, you know, to the, the fuel providers or the energy providers and say, okay, we've got eight, eight fleets that are going to buy a thousand trucks, you know, over the next several years, and they're going to be operating in this region. You know, let's work together to build out the, the, the infrastructure network that we need to support them. Yeah. David Lax has got a great question here because I think we're all hearing the same message right now, and that is, that is uh, critical mineral mining. For batteries, you know, we're, yeah, we're that all, you know, that we're, that we're, is we're all, that is a real issue. Um, and uh, you know, part you know one one of the the things that's happened over the last several decades, you know, as we've had globalization, is we've had an increasing concentration of production of various materials and products in certain parts of the world. And you know, batteries are a, a perfect example of that. Uh, you know, until relatively recently, there wasn't a whole lot of demand for lithium. So lithium was, has primarily been sourced from South America and from Australia. It's been processed at plants in China and then shipped wherever it needs to go into batteries. Um, that's no longer a viable, sustainable solution um, because, um, you know, the, we just, first of all, it doesn't make sense to be shipping lithium, raw lithium from South America to China and then back to North America to put into batteries and EVs. That, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose of uh, reduction. Fortunately, a lot of the, the minerals are actually more widely available. They're, you know, they're, they're present in, the, in the, the Earth's crust. Lithium is the second or third most common element on the planet after hydrogen. Um, and it's, a, it's readily available in North America and Europe, everywhere you go. It's just there's no processing facilities and no extraction facilities for it. That is starting to be developed. Uh, OEMs are starting to invest in that, partner with companies to expand that and localize that production. Uh, same goes for some of the other materials to the, to the degree they can. The one exception is cobalt, um, which is almost entirely in Central Africa. Uh, but um, their you know, manufacturers are moving to uh, battery chemistries that don't, don't rely on cobalt or using different battery chemistries, things like lithium iron phosphate uh, for some use cases where you don't need as much range. Um, there's also some very promising work going on with lithium sulfur. So materials that are uh, cheaper and more readily available. Uh, and essentially you know, between um, between the, the cost and, and uh, environmental concerns, as well as what we've discovered of the fragility of our supply chain over the last couple of years. Um, you know, 
there's a, there's a strong move towards uh, diversifying the sources of these materials and localizing it to the as, as big a degree as they can. And then another key component on the battery side, longer term, is going to be recycling. Um, because it turns out you can ex extract about 95 to 98 percent of those materials uh, from end-of-life batteries, and once once you've extracted that and re-refined it, it actually tends to be better quality materials than the virgin materials. Because you've each time you do that, you've taken out more of the impurities, and so um, there's already some significant recycling going on. Um, with uh, redwood materials, they're they're collecting uh, batteries, consumer electronics batteries, EV batteries, and scrap from both Tesla and uh, Nissan or AESC battery plants in in Nevada and Tennessee, and they're producing raw materials going straight back into battery production for uh, to support about six gigawatt hours of battery production today, even even with relatively few end of life batteries, um, and. Uh, by 2025, they plan to have uh, a capacity for enough materials for 100 gigawatt hours and 500 gigawatt hours by 2030. Uh, and there's a number of other companies also pursuing this. So recycling and diversification of the materials uh, production is going to be a key. So it's going to be a problem or it's not going to be a problem? It's going to be a problem in the short term. Um, it, it hopefully won't be as much of a problem in the long term. Got it. Okay. Um, I, boy, you always know you got a good group that that's that's on the line when when other people can answer the questions before I can even get to them. So uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Park, for uh, getting to Victoria's question. That's a great question too. Um, I, oh, 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 to that point as well. I, I think I also heard this week that uh, Tesla was going to look at a fifty percent reduction of cobalt. Um, I'm not sure what their new battery chemistry is going to be, you know, but it's always seems to be changing. And I think I think their goal was to, you know, reduce cobalt demands. So and I, I didn't quite catch in the article what what they were going to replace it with. So, yeah, any I'm not I'm not sure with Tesla, uh, but GM with their new Altium batteries for their new generation of EVs, starting with the, the Hummer and, and all the other EVs they've got coming out. Those Altium batteries are using a, a nickel manganese cobalt aluminum chemistry that uh, reduces the cobalt content by 70% from what they used in the batteries for the Chevy Bolt. Okay, well, that that's that's amazing. And because I think what I heard you say is that cobalt is really our weakest link here when it comes yeah. to supply chain issues. Yeah, that's the that's the one material that you really don't have much opportunity to diversify. Okay, very good. Um, let me see if I've missed anything. Great questions, you guys. Um, California. California is uh, extracting lithium via geothermal. Lithium Valley Commission. Nice job, California. Uh, again, like I said, technology is just mind boggling. Um, oh, OK, uh, Bill Howell's got a good question. I mean, it comes up all the time. It has to do with fuel tax revenue. Um, any any new words on as getting a little bit off topic, but is, has there been more discussion on on how we're going to uh, cover our road use taxes? I mean, I mean, I know, of course, we talk about vehicle my via VMT tax or most states are going after a registration tax on the vehicles and things like that to make up for it. I mean, no, Jeff, I was on I worked for Capitol Hill at the end of the 90s. We were talking about resurrecting the highway trust fund to make it a more viable and long live to raise enough revenue to take care of the roads and every time it comes up congress kicks the can down the road for the next congress um it's going to take a force of political will to push something new through at the federal level and i uh, i remain now 23 years hence skeptical that a solution is going to be forthcoming anytime soon so i think that debate is going to continue to rage. Um, it'll get more intense as more electric uh, zero emission vehicles come on the roads, more vehicles that run on something other than gasoline and diesel come on the road. Right now, the numbers are so small, the impact is fairly minimal. But the the I think the armies are being amassed. 
And I think we're going to see kind of a bloodbath of political uh, efforts to try to change how our roads are, are funded. Uh, we've seen some states take independent initiatives at their state level, and that's had, we've already seen kind of skirmishes start there. So um, it is very, it's a huge issue long term, short term, not that huge of an issue. Um, it's going to, from a non political guy anymore, now that I'm out of the world, it's going to be fun to watch because I don't have to fight it. But I think it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be bloody. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Guys, we're at the top of the hour. That's been a great, I really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, uh, we've got, uh, there's, oh, oh, there's been a couple of questions on ESG planning. We do have our new white paper, our literature review white paper going out uh, today, I believe. Um, it's a next week. Or next week. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a it's a great review of the history of ESG, where we're at, all the way up to the SEC rulemaking, proposed rulemaking. So something something to look for because this is like the umbrella program for everything we're talking about. Um, and and of course. You know, along along with that goes the Fuels Institute's ESG integrity program where we're helping industry write those plans. So if you got any questions on that, please feel free to reach out and 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 talk to us. Um, I think I think that's all the time we have. Uh, again, if if any, uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sam, for your time and for this great report. Uh, we look at uh, more research in the future with everybody and and getting to some of these answers. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's our pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.